Hi, this is Craig from Startup Stories, and I'm here with uh, Lachlan from Reposit Power uh, to talk about his startup journey. Um, so, Lachlan, tell me a little bit about Reposit Power and um, what you've been doing here. Uh, so, uh, at Reposit, um, we develop software to control batteries in the grid. So, we're essentially the brain of the battery that works with your battery, uh, your solar panels, uh, and all the energy usage in your house to make your bills lower. Um, and ultimately to allow you to use your battery to trade energy um, back into the market and mm. make money. So you've been doing it for a few years now? Yeah, so the company is about three and a half years old and uh, um, my co-founder Dean and I have been working on the idea for over five. Wow, that's quite a while. Yeah, no, I think it's, um, it's funny how the years sort of just roll on by, but uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting journey from sort of the early idea through the effort it actually takes to build a product mm -hmm. and actually commercialise a product. Um, we're now at the stage where we have you know, product in the field and now we're looking to scale the business up and dealing with the challenges of you know, scaling and developing yes. process and making things ah, yes. more efficient. So um, is this your first startup or have you done this before? Uh, so I've done startups before. This is far and away the furthest I've ever got with a startup. Mm -hmm. So I've, uh, I've had sort of the ideation and that sort of early development phase of a startup before, as many entrepreneurs have. But often you, you end up with that the, sort of the critical problem of whether or not you can actually sell a product and whether yes. it's actually something valuable. And so I've had a number of companies in the past that have kind of got to the stage of you know maybe MVP product, but then they sort of crash and burn when it comes to actually um, being a product that Putting people are prepared market. to yeah. you know to pay substantial money for. And I think. Uh, I think that's you know it's always the, the challenge of whether or not what you're working on is valuable. Yes. To yes. the broader public and to yes. your customers who actually then you know choose whether or not they part with a dollar for the service that you're offering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you do have to invest a bit of time at the front end to actually get it far enough so you can actually test that market as well. So you can't just say, oh, this is an idea, you know, it won't work, throw it away. Sometimes you've got to do a bit of work first. Oh, most definitely. And I think the the challenge with a lot of um, startups is that yeah, because you have to do that work, you are investing you know, sometimes years to work out whether or not um, you can answer a particular question in the affirmative. And so I think, you know, particularly in Australia, we always sort of see startups not working as a failure, but it's not so much a failure. Sometimes you answer the question, it's just yes. the answer to the question is that people do not want <laughs> yes. or are not prepared to pay for yes. the product or service that you've actually been able it's, to do. It's, it's a test or an experiment, it's not a, a failure, you know, you have to, and you have to find out the answer or, yeah, other people will find out eventually. Yeah, exactly right, and I think that's the nature of these kind of companies, you know, mm -hmm. you, it takes time to develop some initial prototype or some proof of concept or some initial product that you can test with, then you have that period of time actually testing it. And at that stage, you've, you know, you've learned the answer to the question of whether or not it's going to be viable. Um, but I think looking at it as a, looking at it as a fad is the wrong way mm. to think about it because ultimately, um, you've learned something through that process. You definitely learn how to answer the question. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, you you, know, you have to go through that process of yeah. learning about experimentation and learning how to run a business and you know even mechanistic stuff like learning how to deal with the ATR and things like that. It's, yeah. all, it's all part of running a business. Yeah, and you're building a network and you're building skills and doing all of that and, and then you're applying it the next time around. Yeah. Most definitely. And I think with Reposit it's interesting because there are a lot of the lessons I learned previously I've seen again in Reposit. But rather than taking months to learn what you would do in that circumstance, you sort of know intuitively because you, yeah. you went through it last time and worked out what the answer was. Or you know who in your network has a particular set of capabilities that will be able to assist you. Yeah. And I think it, um, you know, it does make a difference once you've had that experience coming into a new venture and not needing to make those same mistakes again or you know, learning the same lessons again. Yeah. So what, what has made you keep going back and doing startups rather than you know, going and getting a job somewhere, working for somebody else, doing something else with your life? Why startups? Uh, startups are really addictive. I, um, I find it just the thought that you could you, know, you can have an idea and that you can believe that the status quo is not how it should be and then you can sort of sit down and work and then challenge the status quo I think has a lot of attraction to me. Mm. It, um, I like that concept that you work hard and by working hard you're able to you know, change the world hopefully for the better um, and so you know it is a lot of hard work going through these kind of businesses but Having said that, it's it's so worthwhile that every time you sort of come back, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, no, that's great. I, 
you know, I'd really miss it if I wasn't doing this. So yeah. I don't know how well I'd be in a normal job. I think that's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like a lot of us, you mightn't be as well suited for a, for an office or well, nine to five office working for somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I've never actually had a real job, so I mm. couldn't actually compare what startup life is well, like. Well, this is a real job. Well, it is now. It's yeah. nice. I have yeah. a salary, so it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what are some of the biggest lessons you think you've learned on, on this startup journey, either with Reposit or previous startups? Oh, I mean, I think probably the first one is you just, you've just got to dive in and have a go. And I think that's a big mistake that a lot of um, entrepreneurs make, is that they spend a lot of time sort of analysing, over-analysing, trying to work out how exactly they're going to make it work. And uh, I think that's something that you, you just can't do. Like, it's not, this is yep. not a theoretical pursuit. This is, um, this is something that you learn by doing. Yes. Uh, and I think that's something really valuable that I've learned, probably in Reposit, actually. Um, and so my co-founder, Dean, is a you know, particularly interesting example of this. He just he, he dives in and he does things. And I've come out of an academic environment which has a much more theoretical bent where you don't do that, and I think it's invaluable to actually have that approach of diving in and doing it first, because if you don't dive in, you don't know the answer to the question. Yeah. So you can spend a lot of time um, wondering, whereas the answer is probably just the, the other end of actually taking an action and seeing mm. what happens. The analysis paralysis. Yeah. 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 You know, just get started. And, you know, you'll learn some lessons either way. But yeah. it'd be better to be learning them and iterating on them rather than sort of deferring them. To yeah, the and continually later. asking the question. Yeah. So I think that's a really, um, really valuable one. I think obviously you know, surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than yourself, both in terms of you know, the people you work with um, and the advisors that you have around you. I don't think many people realise the extent to which they will have an impact on the business that you run mm. until you have access to these resources. And it's, you know, five or six years ago when I was first starting out, you know, I didn't know, you know who I'd ask legal questions to or who I'd ask accounting questions to or strategic questions. And now yeah. it's nice to have who I go to for each of those. Um, and it's nice to have a team that has all these skills that you know, I personally didn't have at mm. the start of Repositor and start of another business. Um, and through them, you know, I learned quite a lot as well. But we're able to sort of, you know, to bring it all together to actually deliver something that's valuable. And in yeah. Deposit's case, to deliver something that's, you know, valuable for a you know, pretty substantial industry like energy. Well, yeah, well, everybody uses energy, really, around the world. And, you know, every and at the moment with the shift towards batteries and, and generating from home and that sort of thing, it's a, it's a huge market. Yeah, it is. I think it's, energy is an interesting one just in the sense that you know, 50, 60 years ago, when we first were building grids in Australia and globally, you know, the expectation was that you would you know, flip the switch and the lights would come on, and you people didn't think too hard about energy aside from that. And it's evolved into an industry where there's many you know, large players, multi-billion dollar companies, and consumers really, you know, they, um, they're forced to pay whatever the, the bill is for their energy. And the shift we're seeing now is that you're seeing small companies, you know, like Reposit, actually able to participate in that space. And we're seeing consumers who have a desire to understand their energy and be involved in you know, their energy future. Um, and through their empowerment, they're actually changing you know, the nature of the grid. And over the next decade, we're going to see really substantial changes as they go from being sort of unempowered, passive consumers to being engaged prosumers who mm. actually who own infrastructure and who participate in the operation of the grid. Um, and that's a really significant change and a really important one because consumers will get their voice back. And, yes. Uh, that's something they've lost in the energy space. So uh, what are some of the challenges, uh, you say some of the top challenges you've encountered as you've gone on, on the startup journey? Um, I think, I mean, I think always the, the, the first challenge is whether or not the idea you have is actually sort of, you know, worthy of your time and I think, you know, we talked a bit before about how you've just got to dive in. I think sometimes it's so easy to have ideas that there is this, um, not just analysis process when, when you're working on an idea, but prior to actually choosing an idea to work on. So I think, you know, you've just got to dive in, you've got to be prepared to back yourself on that front. Once you actually have ideas, it's, you've just got to work through the hard yards of actually building it. I think, you know, if we look at something like Reposit, most of the companies who are in this space are worth a few billion dollars. Mm -hmm. We're a small company. 
So you've got to work really hard to build something that actually operates within that environment. Yes. Um, so I don't know if that's a challenge so much as it is an opportunity, but you've got to be prepared to put in the hard yards in order to do that. It's certainly not like the movies paint startups. You know, <laughs> no. You have no, an idea like that. two hours later you're floating your company for a hundred billion. So, <laughs> yes. Sub sub substantially longer journeys than that. Then practical considerations, I think, you know, you want to, it's, unless you happen to have a very large bank balance before you start a business, you're typically going to be raising investment and that creates its own challenges of finding investors, you know, understanding what they want out of participating in a venture, um, negotiating those kind of deals through to then actually just running a business. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm really good at control theory and I like writing software but then you're also getting into things like you know, people management and yes. promotions and marketing, finance and economics, and it's kind of all these new fields you never necessarily knew you'd have to have expertise in. You have to learn enough to be um, to navigate them yes. and enough to then you know, work with and hire other experts who can then sort of help you navigate your way through that, um, through that journey. So I think those, you know, those are sort of the main um, challenges and you know, probably the last one I think is worth touching on is just the actual challenge of being in a position to change how the world works. Like I think it can be um, it can be a little bit isolating at times because you sort of start off on these journeys, and I mean people typically call you crazy at the start, mm -hmm. which is probably a good sign. Yes, um, if they didn't think you were crazy. It's probably not different. Um, <laughs> not different enough. Yes, but it's a you know it's a long hard slog. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, you know, being mentally strong during that is a really important thing and something that I think a lot of founders um, and entrepreneurs really struggle with, you know, sort of the, there's a depressive element to just working away at something and working away at something and I think you've got to learn to be comfortable with the fact that it is, there is a huge amount of uncertainty in what you're doing. Yes. Um, but the benefit of actually doing it is that you actually get that opportunity to actually change something and so seeing it from a positive view rather than being weighed down by the journey I think is a really important challenge that we all face but that we all have to learn to overcome. Yeah. So with those sort of challenges obviously you've overcome a lot of them with Reposit like you've you've really stepped out of the startup space into the next phase you know you're in growth phase now. What sort of you know new challenges has that really brought for you because you know, it is a big transition. Well, the first one that's sort of obvious is that you no longer get to operate within your core discipline. And so Reposit was the two founders, um, myself and Dean, really came at it from, you know, I'm a, a control analytics startup person and you know, Dean's come from a sort of software banking energy perspective. And so the idea for Reposit really came from the amalgamation of the two of those. But now we, you know, we're operating beyond just the ideas and you know, building the technology to actually operate in that space, it's about you know, how do you actually build a strong process and how do you flesh out your team and mm -hmm. who do you need to complement you and what skills do you need and how do you work with you know, particular um, outsourcing agencies for certain things. Yes. It's, it's, it's a, like a lot of the challenges now are about how you turn a business from being a you know, a heavy R&D group into a procedural group where things are slick and efficient and you're, you know, you're heavily focused on your interactions with customers and you know, trying to minimise any friction that they feel yes. to engage with you. And from an engineering standpoint, I think that can be a little terrifying sometimes because you suddenly realise that there's a human at the other end of your technology and they have particular wants and needs and they want value mm -hmm. um, that your product or service has to deliver. And um, it's a really important perspective to have, I think, and one that's, you know, we've, we've seen that now for, you know, for, for 18 months since we've had product in the field, but it does require you to come at the problem from a different perspective and actually realise that all the, you know, all the ideas and thoughts and things that you have that you bring into a business ultimately are there to serve your customer. Yes. And so you have to actually appreciate the fact that your customers are going to drive the value you deliver and that really does change how your business operates. Yes, it's a, it's a big transition for a lot of startups and it's where a lot of them, you know, encounter some of their biggest challenges is making that switch from, you know, doing all the product development, no matter how agile or iterative or, 
customer centric it is to actually then servicing customers at scale and being able to you know grow and manage that um, and continue to evolve the product as all the products as they go it is a is a really big challenge I've seen a lot of startups you know sort of have difficulty there I think it's quite humbling because you have to go from being someone who um, has the initial ideas and who you know injects the initial momentum into a product to being um, particularly as a founder someone who's prepared to listen to what your customers um, want and value and to be able to accept that you know you're then one of a huge team that's working on this and so it's no longer you know you have to very rapidly realize that ideas are not super valuable Mm -hmm. And it's the, it, the value comes from what you build and what you deliver and what you, you know, what you're able to accomplish as a much larger team. Yes. And I think if you learn that, it's great because you get to appreciate the journey with everyone else who's going on it with you. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, I think it can be um, it can be quite heartbreaking for young entrepreneurs to realise that they're not in like they're no longer the driver. No, and it's not that they they can't have a view that there's mm -hmm. too much genius involved. Like it's uh, you know, success comes from actually building something that's valuable to others yes. and being prepared to support how that value rolls out to others. Yeah, it has to be sustainable as well. You know, it has to last. You know, beyond your involvement in in the organisation in some senses, um, because it really has to be able to take that life on of, of its own. Yeah, well, we've gone from you know five years ago to. To, you know, two of us working out of cafes, talking about ideas. There's 15 of us in the office today, plus, I don't know, probably another you know, 20 or 30 outsourcers that we work with across a variety of different um, domains to through to our partners who help mm -hmm. sell our product, and that might, they might number in the many hundreds. Mm -hmm. So it, um, yeah, it's a substantially bigger footprint. Yeah, it's than, a big scale. And when you start, and because you then only represent, you know, one tiny bit of it, you have to be, you have to recognise that your you know, your contribution is valuable, but it's it does diminish over time, and ultimately, organisations will will outlast their founders and should be designed to outlast their founders. Yes, yes. Well, the best ones, I think, are most definitely. I mean, because founders ultimately too often need the opportunity to eventually move on. Yes. Um, but the business also needs to. be to operate without them, and I, you know, I couldn't imagine um, some of the very large businesses that we sort of hear about in the startup space, where they have leaders who are, you know, intimately involved in every mm -hmm. single decision. I mean, it, it must be horrific to work there and to know that no one has any autonomy. Yes, yes. There's one autocrat sitting at the top who wants to make every decision. I think that's it's a crazy way to build a business. Mm -hmm. So. Um Obviously, you know, you, you've gotten to this point, so you know, this is quite a long way and it's further than you've got to before. What are the some of the things you'd say to uh, other people who are looking at you know, starting up a business or have done it a few times and not yet sort of hit on their recipe as yet? Oh, look, there's a lot of good luck in, uh, in getting to you know, any level of success in a business and I think it's important that people recognise that. The one thing I think that can aid it is actually being prepared to tackle large problems. Mm -hmm. you know, I think sometimes we we feel that you know before we tackle the large problem, we'll just tackle the smaller problem because that'll set us up to tackle the larger problem. And I think from a business perspective, all businesses are equally hard to run. So mm -hmm. you can it's going to be difficult to run a business. You can choose to run a business that's tackling a small problem with lots of competitors. <laughs> yeah. Or you can choose to tackle a big problem. And ironically. Yes, it's lots of hard work, but probably the same amount of hard work, but it's a different space to operate in because you're not in this super competitive space where everyone's trying to do the same thing. And that does give you opportunities to actually you know, do something substantial, actually mm -hmm. make a change. So I think that's one thing. I think um, people underestimate their own abilities and they should be prepared to tackle um, yeah, big problems. Mm -hmm. um, people need to find the right other people to surround them with. So the majority of the startups that I've had previously, either as founder or as you know as a participant, have ultimately probably failed because the wrong people were mm -hmm. on the bus for a variety. You know, sometimes it's just major personality defects um, and things where you just you sort of dive into the business and all of a sudden you realise that it's 
you know, the people you're involved with probably don't have the same values as you and are not prepared yes. to make um, the sort of decisions you would want to make or to, you know, have the underlying philosophy that's similar, you know, to what you value. I think that's a big problem because if you find the right people, you actually focus on doing what you're doing rather than focusing on dealing with all the, you know, potential problems mm -hmm. um, that arise in there. Um, but again, I think number one is just go and do it. Yep. So, um, so too often I, I see a lot of people kind of planning and strategizing and talking about it and I think you've just ultimately got to start. But the bullet, get yeah. in there. And if it fails, that's fine. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, I don't yeah, know. As long as you've like, learned something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and if you do it, like, it's possible to, to fail well. I don't mm. think that's something you mm. probably forget in Australia. You fail well when you learn, when you, t you, know, when you take something from yes. it, you learn something. And if you don't take something from starting a business, then I don't know what you're doing. Because no. they're, very, they're very easy to learn lessons from because there's so much stuff happening around you all the time. You're exposed to so many new ideas that um, it's inevitable that you will learn something by doing mm. it. Um, so yeah, dive in, be prepared to uh, to do something wrong, learn your lesson, and then do it again. And if you fail well, nobody holds it against you. Nobody, uh, you know, no. people are more than willing to support you. And I think that's one thing that I have learned over the years is that the more you're prepared to actually take a risk and put yourself out there, um, the more people are prepared to back you because it's very rare you make the same mistakes twice. Yeah. And so there's only a, you know there's only so many mistakes you can possibly make. You might as well learn them <laughs> <laughs> and then get on with it. You're not going to make them again. Yes. Um, and finally, um, would you do it over again? Uh, yeah, most definitely. Mm. It's, um, there are some days when you sort of when you wake up and you're exhausted and you're sort of like, oh, what am I doing? It's like you know, I could be working in a normal job and things like that. But the reality is it. You know, a normal job would be horrific. I would have anywhere near the, um, <laughs> exposure to interesting people and interesting ideas. Um, it's just great. Like you, you're able to do something that changes how the world functions, and that's yes. um, yeah. I don't think you can underestimate how important that is to have a mm -hmm. sense of purpose when you get up in the morning. And so, no, for me, it's um, yeah, in a heartbeat, and I'm sure. You know, Whatever I do long term beyond deposit, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to be back in startups again. Yep, no, fantastic. Much to my wife's displeasure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on on how big, I suppose. You know, the payday is when when you actually you know, move on from deposit. Really, that's true. I don't. Um, I don't think you can think about it. It's uh, no. It's not. Um, yeah, no, planning you, your exit too early can be quite detrimental as well. Oh, and I think too, you, you can't build. You can't build a business with a view that it's something big's going to happen. You, no. You have to build a business nope. to deliver value to your customers. That's right. And um, that's the sole focus. And if along the way you're successful and you know maybe another company comes along and buys you or you have an opportunity to IPO or you know, maybe you end up with a super profitable company, that's great. Mm. But the goal should be to actually build and run a company, mm. not to build and flip it. Yeah. Because the companies that get flipped typically are the ones that were built to, oh. to run. Yes. Um, so you need to make it attractive for your customers first and foremost. That's right. Oh, well, thank you very much for your time today, Lachlan. Wish you all the best with Reposit. Thanks very much. Into the future. Cheers.